When I was a boy, my dad used to keep a pocket knife in his desk drawer in his office. And I was fascinated by this knife. Uh, my dad always had the coolest stuff. I, I just always wanted to, to play with my dad's stuff. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys can identify with that. You, you wanted to just basically mess up all of his stuff, his tools, his cars, his clothes, anything and everything, because we wanted to be like our dads. And so we, I, I wanted this knife. I wanted to play so badly with this knife. But the rule in our house was that small boys do not play with knives, uh, which I think is a pretty good rule, right? I mean, you don't think that's a good rule? I'm worried about your kids. You guys have like season passes to the emergency room. Um, I wanted to play with this knife. And so I would, I would pull out the desk drawer and I'd peek in there and I'd look at it. And I'd hear the devil telling me, play with the knife, pick it up. Did, did your dad really say you can't play with the knife? Um, and so I would look at it and I'd shut the drawer. And then finally one day I just decided... I'm going to live in sin, and I'm going to play with that knife. I pulled the knife out, and I slipped it into my pocket, and I scurried down the hallway where no one was looking, and I pulled the knife out. I began to examine it and to marvel at it and to rub my hands on it, and it it was this, the, the, the outside of the pocket knife was like this copper, and the inside was a steel blade, and just was, you know, marveling at its craftsmanship. Then I opened it. When I opened the knife, I thought, man, if I could just carry a knife with me every day like this, everything in the world would be right. I mean, my life would be complete. Why would my father withhold from me such a great and wonderful thing such as this knife? And so I began to play with it and imagine I was Peter Pan, you know, on, against Captain Hook, saving the day. Well, after I uh, had finished playing with it, I decided I better put it away so I don't get into trouble. And I went to shut the knife, and the wife, knife would not shut. It wouldn't shut. And I, I, what is wrong with this knife? I thought it was just stuck. I, I was too young to know that there's such a thing as a locking blade. That some knives, in case you don't know, when you open them, they make this little click sound, and they're locked. And unless you, you know where the release is and you, can, you push it, it, that knife will not close. I didn't know that. I just thought it was stuck. And so I decided I'm going to push a little bit harder on this knife. Some of you know where this story is going. <laughs> well, finally, one last time I decided... I I can't go put this knife back in the drawer open. That would give it away that somebody had been, you know, playing with my dad's knife. And I tried one more time to force it shut, and the knife didn't shut, but it opened my finger as the blade slid across my uh, skin. So now I've got a, a knife in one hand and a bloody finger that won't close and that won't stop bleeding. And that's when I said, you know what? I think I'm in over my head on this one. I I better go back. I better just, I better pay the piper. I better suck it up. And I better go talk to dad. I better go confess. And that was a long, that was a long road, right? That, that the road to a confession is always a long walk. And so I finally went in and showed my dad, hey, I'm sorry. I've been playing with this knife and uh, slice my finger open and you know, here it is and expecting discipline, rightfully deserved, expe- expecting uh, punishment, expecting a lecture, expecting um, why did you do that? Don't you know you're not supposed to do that? But my, when my dad saw me, he just bandaged up my wounds. He told me it was going to be all right. And instead of condemnation, what I really felt was love. And 
my dad had seen in my eyes that I had learned my lesson as I sliced my finger open playing with the knife. And I still to this day have a scar on my finger. And that scar, it, it reminds me of my sin. That scar also reminds me of my father's love that he had for me, that he demonstrated to me that day. You know, there's somebody else who has some scars that also remind us of our sin, but also remind us of our Father's love. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus, he told a story in Luke chapter 15. If you would open there in your Bibles today. Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells a story similar to this. The great spiritual truth. And in Luke chapter 15, verse 1, it sets the stage for, for why Jesus tells this story. Luke 15, verse 1 says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to Jesus. The tax collectors and the sinners are, are drawing to Jesus. Now, in Jesus' day, a tax collector that was kind of a bad person. Um, if you're here today and you collect taxes for a living, we love you. We're glad that you're here with us. I know April 15th is coming, and so maybe stay out of our way until then. But um, in, in Jesus' day, a tax collector was a, a horrible person because what they did was they would, they would take extra money from their neighbors and keep, the, keep, keep it. They, they would take the taxes, but they would also skim off the top. And so they would charge more than what was owed so that they could profit off of their position. And so within the community in that day, tax collectors were despised. They were looked down upon. They, they received taxes for the Roman government, but they were Jewish people. And so you were looked at as a traitor because you were doing the dirty work for the, Jew, for the Roman occupant, occu, the occupation. And so, but these people are drawn to Jesus. All throughout the Gospels, we see that the outcasts, the, the sinners, the, the prostitutes, the, the people that are looked down upon in society are constantly being drawn to Jesus. That there's something about Jesus that is compelling. That it's, there's something about Jesus that's, that's a little bit different from the other religious leaders of that day. There's something about Jesus that draws people into a relationship. And I believe that what they felt and sensed was honestly the love of the Father that was expressed through Jesus. That the other religious leaders, quite frankly, just did not have. Yet we see these people being drawn to Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He invites them in. In fact, one of Jesus' own disciples was a tax collector. He draws them into relationship. And the story goes that as he's doing this, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they begin to grumble about this. They begin to whisper amongst themselves and say things like, if Jesus is a righteous man, why is he hanging out with these unrighteous sinners? Jesus is supposed to be this great spiritual leader. How, how can a holy man spend time with unholy people? Jesus overhears this conversation. It tells you a lot about where uh, the religious establishment was in those days. And their view of the outsider, their view of people who were in sin. Jesus overhears this conversation, and to illustrate what he's doing in inviting these people in, he gives this story. Um, it's called a parable, and it's in verse 11. A parable is an earthly story that communicates an eternal truth. And in verse 11, he tells this parable about a man. And it says in verse 11 that there was a man who had two sons. Now, that's a great gift from God, two sons. I have two children, and uh, I delight in my children. I love my children. 
Uh, there is nothing in the world that is more important to me than my wife and my two kids. Nothing. Nothing. You could, you could take everything I own and set it on fire, but if I have my wife and kids, no big deal. We'll just start over. The, the, people are eternal, and so my wife and my two kids and my son that will be here in June um, are, they mean the world to me. And I, I view myself as blessed by God to have the children that I have. The Bible would teach us that children are a blessing from God. Those of us who have children, we know that, hey, God has blessed us with these children. Did you know that you were designed to be a blessing to your parents? How many of you have uh, fallen short in that, right? <laughs> I think we all at some level could raise our hands to that. But this is a blessed man because he has two sons. He, he would have... In, in that culture, in that day, he would have viewed himself as a man who was blessed by God because God had bestowed upon him two sons. And the story continues that the younger of the two said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. The younger son approaches his dad one day and says, Dad, you know I've been thinking. If you could just give me my inheritance today, I would really appreciate it. If you could just give me what's coming to me, I think that's what this says, give me the property that is coming to me. Now there's only one problem with this scenario. The dad is still alive. You don't receive an inheritance until the person passes away. You don't bestow upon somebody uh, the, the, the things that you're going to leave to them until that you are gone. And the, the son uh, cre uh, breaks this incredible protocol and he goes to his father and he says to him, give me what's coming to me. And what he's telling his dad is this, I'm no longer interested in, in having a relationship with you. I'm no longer interested in being counted as your son. I'm no longer interested in being a part of this family and what we have going here. In fact, I, I think I'd just like to part ways with you right now. So just give to me what's coming to me and you'll never have to see me again. What this son is essentially saying to his father is, you're dead to me. You're dead to me. Give me what's coming to me, and I will get out of your hair. Now, I can only imagine the heartache that this father must have felt. I can only imagine what I would feel like if one of my two children came to me and said, Dad, I don't want you to be my dad anymore. You're dead to me. Just give me what you're going to give me so I can disappear. I would be crushed. My, my world would, would come crashing down because my kids and my family, that's, that's everything to me. And to have a child that says, I'm more interested in the stuff you can give me than the relationship that we have would have crushed this father. Yet it says that the father divided his property between them. The father complied. The father did what his son asked him to do. And it says in verse 13 that not many days later, the, other, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. That not many days later, he... That what his inheritance would have included land, it would have included property, it would have included enterprise, it would have included a business, a family business that he had to split down the two to, to give half of it to him and half of it to his son, it would have been, his other son. It would have included um, livestock, a way of, of living. And the son sells it all. This property that, that very well likely could have been in their family for generations, handed down. He sells it. He gathers his things together. He, he turns a profit from it, and then he hits the road. 
He sells his inheritance. And it says he takes a journey to a faraway country, basically saying, I'm out of here. How far from this family can I get? How far from my father can I go? And in this faraway country, it says that he squandered his property in reckless living, in wild living. He goes to this faraway country, far away from his father, and he just begins to throw parties. Wild living, reckless living. He doesn't take his inheritance and build upon it. He doesn't take his inheritance and invest it. No, he takes everything his father has ever worked for and blows it away. Wastes it. Reckless living, wild living. Later on in the story, the older brother is going to accuse the younger brother of squandering his father's inheritance on prostitutes. That he, he, he lets go of any morality. He lets go of any sense of right and wrong and just wants to live and have a good time and is spending his money on anything that he thinks can bring that to him. And it says that when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. The money ran out. The party stopped. I want you to know that sin for a moment is an, is an enjoyable experience. That for a moment we are lured into sin by the, the joy that we think it will bring us, the happiness that we think it will bring us. But in the end, it always runs out. In the end, that purse always runs dry. In the end, it always leaves with it a trail of death and destruction. I can imagine when he, he, he got to the end and he opens up his sack and it's just, you know, moths come out like a cartoon. You know, it's just... He, he, he realizes, I have wasted it all. What do I have to show for it? Nothing. It's a little bit like that sinking feeling when you go to hand somebody your card at the register and they look back at you and they say, uh, non-sufficient funds. <laughs> sorry. I was like, oh, here, try this one. Oh, no, sorry. Okay, well, can I just please have this stuff? He has nothing to show for his inheritance. He's wasted it all. And it says that he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. He went looking for a job. He went and hired himself to go and to do a job, to, to try and get by, to try and survive. As he's come into great need. And it says that that man sent him to feed pigs in his fields. Now, in Jewish culture, the dirtiest of dirty animals is a pig. A, a Jewish man would never even touch a pig because of, of how filthy and dirty it is in their culture and in their minds. And at this point in the story, the Jesus' listeners would have said, oh, oh, just that's too far. That's too far. Number one, this son, he's rebellious. He, he, he hates his father. He's squandered his inheritance. And now you're telling me he's feeding pigs? Come on, this, this is an unbelievable story. The, in, in their stomachs, it would have turned over. It, have, it would have made them sick to their stomach to even imagine this person in this scenario. But it says that he was so hungry that he was longing to be fed with the food that the pigs ate. That as he fed the pigs and threw slop into their trough, his mouth began to water because of how hungry he was, because of how far he had fallen. And it says that no one gave him anything. All of his friends were gone. The people he had spent all of his money on, where are they now? There he is with the pigs living like an animal, longing to eat what they're eating. 
Verse 17 says, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. He came to himself. He looked around and he said, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this? To what end? I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Verse 20 says that he arose and he came to his father. I don't know how long of a journey that was. I'm sure it was a long journey because he was in a faraway country. But he had left his father wealthy. He had left his father with his inheritance. He had left his father with many possessions. And he's returning empty-handed, broken, with nothing to show for, in shame for how he's been living. That was a long walk. The, the road to a confession is always a long walk. And he had to wonder, what lies in store for me? Will my father reject me? Will my father even acknowledge my presence? Will my father cast me out of his house? Will he, will he take me in? Will he even let me be a servant in his house? Will he even let me scrub the floors here? I imagine that many times he was probably tempted to say, it's not, it's not worth the shame. It's not worth the, the embarrassment. It's, it's not worth having my sin exposed. It's not worth my father knowing what I've done. Nevertheless, he perseveres. And it says <laughs> that while he was still a long way off, if his father saw him and felt compassion. His father wasn't filled with anger. His father wasn't filled with rage. His father wasn't filled with judgment and condemnation. What did his father feel when he saw that son? Compassion. He felt love for that lost son. And it says that he ran and embraced him and he kissed him. He took him in his arms and he kissed his son. And the son tried to talk to his father. He tried to, 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 to give his speech that he had prepared. He said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father cuts his speech short. He says, the father says to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. He came back barefoot. He came back naked and barefoot. He had nothing. His father looks upon him with compassion on his broken son who had been beaten up by the world. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us throw a feast and celebrate. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. His heart, the father's heart, when he saw the son re turning home as he was peering out over the horizon and he saw this, this weakened, this battered, this broken, naked figure of a man who had lost everything, who had spent it all, who had wasted everything he had worked for. When he saw him returning, love overflowed in his heart to joy, to celebration. Can you imagine what that first embrace would have felt like to that son? 
that son who is returning home with his head bowed in shame, probably not even able to look his father in the eye for what he had done to his family name. And he's trying to mutter some words about, Dad, I'm, I'm not worthy to be your son. And the father just grabs him. Doesn't even listen to that speech. What are you talking about? You're my son. Somebody put some clothes on this kid because my son doesn't go around dressed like this. Somebody put some shoes on his feet. This is my son who was dead and is now alive. It would have been that, that love that, that was in that embrace, it would have conquered the shame. It would have drowned out the noise of that brokenness. It would have begun to say, you're right. I, I am your son. I am a son of the king. I am a son of my father. But this is not just a story about a son and a father. This is actually our story. This is our story. We're the younger son in this story. And God is our heavenly father. And the truth is that all of us have gone our own way like this younger son. That all of us have sinned against God. That all of us have said, we're going to go our own way. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to follow what's in our own hearts. And God the whole time is there waiting. Waiting for us to return home. But not only that, our Heavenly Father sent His only Son to come and find us. He sent His Son Jesus in the world to come and rescue us from our sins, to come and pull us out of it. Jesus came to pay back the debt. Jesus paid back the debt. This son in the story, he could have never paid it debt back, but Jesus paid the debt back. The debt of sin that we owed that we could never repay, Jesus paid it for us when he died on the cross for us. So that, through Jesus, we too could feel the embrace of our Heavenly Father. So that all of us who have been estranged, who have gone our own way, that when we come back, that through Jesus, we can feel wrapped in his arms, that we can feel the love of God, our Heavenly Father. And we all come to our Father this way. Broken. Naked. Ashamed. And our Father treats us all the same way. And he embraces us with his love. And that love, it overpowers the shame, it overpowers the guilt. He calls us his own. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says that we in our sins were dead. That the sin in our lives, it brought separation between us and God. That we followed our own hearts, that we followed the, the sin that was in us and we chose to turn away from God. But verse 4 says that God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive in Christ. It is by grace that you have been saved. And he raised us up with him. That just as Christ was raised from the dead, so we too are raised up with him in new life. And it says that he has seated us, he has placed us in heaven with Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works. Not a one of us in here measures up to God's standard. Not a one of us in here has not sinned, has not at some point played the role of that younger son. But God, 
because of his great love for us, sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus did the work we could not do. He repaid the debt that we could not repay. In his body, he bore the punishment for my sin. And on that cross, he died in my place. In my place. And they took him off that cross and then laid that broken, beaten, lifeless body in that tomb. And there it sat. I want you to know that today that tomb is not filled with someone's body. I want you to know that today that tomb is empty. Because on the... Th <laughs> because on the third day, on that Sunday, Jesus rose from death into life. That God looked on the sacrifice of his son and said, he's paid it in full. He validated the work he had done on the cross as he raised his own son from the dead. And Jesus Christ rose in victory. <laughs> he did not... Rise defeated. But he rose in victory. Having conquered Satan. Having conquered sin. Having conquered hell. Having conquered death. That Jesus Christ is victorious over death. The Bible says that there's not a grave that could hold him down. The Bible says that for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus. That the same power which gave life to Jesus, the same power which raised him up from the dead, that it dwells in us, that that power is in us, that we too are victorious in Christ. And so because of my faith in Jesus and because of the resurrection, I have been brought out of darkness and into light. Because of the resurrection, I am no longer lost, but I have been found because of the resurrection, I'm no longer bound by sin, but I have been set free. I'm victorious over it. Because of the resurrection, I no longer have to hang my head in shame, but I can approach God boldly because of grace. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, I have passed from death into life. And this is why we celebrate on Easter Sunday. This is why we are joyful. This is why we sing. This is why we shout. Because Jesus Christ is victorious. He's not defeated. Because Jesus Christ is not in the grave. He's seated in heaven. Because it's Jesus that we adore. It's Jesus that we praise. It's Jesus who's worthy of all honor. It's Jesus who's worthy of all glory. It's Jesus who's making all things new. It's Jesus who brings us from death into life. It's Jesus who is the Son of God and is the Savior of the world. You might be here today and you're wondering, man, where am I at with God? The things that I have done. You might be here today and you're still that younger son. You're still in sin. It's sin has separated you from God. You know it. You don't need me to speak down to you. You can feel it in your own heart. The Bible says that Jesus was sent here to seek and to save the lost. If you're here today, I want you to know that God is calling out your name. He's saying to you, would you come home today? Would you come home today? How long? How long are you going to live life feeding the pigs? How long are you going to be separated from your father? The father is compelling you today. Come home. 
Come home. You might say, you don't understand. You don't understand the things that I've done. You don't understand what I've said and who I've said it to. I think, I think, it's, I think it's too far gone for me. You're, you're right. I, I don't understand. I don't know you and everything of your life. I don't. But God does. And he's saying, come on. Come on. Would you come home today? Would you come home to his outstretched arms that are open and waiting, ready to embrace you? There's no sin too big or strong enough to... That, that the resurrection power of Jesus Christ cannot overcome. When Jesus rose from the dead, he rose victorious over all sin. And when we come to him, all of our sins are forgiven. All of our sins are wiped away. We are made new. It's, in fact, it's as if we never even sinned because of the work that Christ did for us. So how do you receive it? How do you receive this eternal life, this new life, this forgiveness of sins? It's so simple. All we need to do is follow the example of that younger son who came home. And he came home and he said, Dad, I've messed up. Dad, I've blown it. The father will wrap you in his arms. It's called confession. We confess what we've done to God. God is there. He's here. He's here right now. You come and say, I'm a sinner who needs a Savior. And you put your faith in Jesus Christ. You quit putting your faith in yourself and you put it in Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross and the victory that he won as he rose from the dead. To receive it, you just simply turn from that sin and you trust in Jesus. Jesus was sent here to rescue you. Jesus was sent here to this earth on a rescue mission to rescue humanity. Because we were not coming to our senses. <laughs> we were enjoying the pods. We were enjoying eating what the pigs ate in our sin. So God sent Jesus here to wipe it all away, to, to pay the price, to pull us out of it.